This morning, as I was preparing for this sermon, uh, I got on this website, and this website has um, literally people write in their excuses for different categories of whatever, um, categories of time. They can't meet up with a certain individual, or I can't make it here, or there's a category of excuses of why I sleep at work, or there's an excuses of why I can't make it at work. Um, so I just wanted to read to you all a couple of these. First category is time excuses for not meeting up for, for whatever reason. I super glued my eye thinking it was contact solution. <clears throat> Do you know how long it takes to give a dollar to every Santa you see? Can't meet up with them because that's their excuse. Uh, I'm stuck in the blood pressure machine down at Food Giant. When I got up this morning, I took two X-Lax tablets in addition to my Prozac. I can't get off the commode, but I feel really good about it. <laughs> work excuses. I just found out that I was switched at birth legally and I shouldn't come into work knowing my employee records may now contain false information. Um, I saw a fire truck as I was coming to work and I went home to make sure that my house wasn't on fire. I wasn't sleeping. Uh, I was meditating on the mission statement and envisioning a new paradigm. And here's the last one. I'll be in later this morning. Now, let me just stop and pause that supposedly these are legit excuses that people wrote into this, this website. So bear with me. I'll be in later this morning. My girlfriend's husband is dying and I have to be there to console her. <laughs> as funny and ridiculous as these seem, all of us have given excuses for one way or another in our life. This morning, what I want us to do is just to take a thorough, good examination of our hearts. Because when we give excuses, it can spiritually paralyze our relationship with God. Let us pray. Father God, this morning is yours. This day is yours. Our life is yours. Father, I pray that my mouth would not be my words, but that I would be a trumpet, that I would be a broken vessel that you use to communicate your truths, your word. Open our hearts, open our minds to your truth, to your very word that you have spoken to us this morning. In your heavenly name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. If you will make it to the Gospel of John, open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in front of your pews up top. They're right around the sound table right there. As you look open to the Gospel of John, chapter 5, I kind of want to go over the context, the background, before we just dive in real quick. The Gospel of John was written by Noah himself, the beloved John. It was written between 90 and 100 A.D. He wrote it for two reasons. One, for the deity of Christ, and two, for the reader to understand about how to gain eternal life. In that twofold, it was a three division. Number one, John talks about sin, and that no one can come to the Father unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two, he talks that Jesus is the living Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he is the prophesied one, that he is the Lamb of God. And number three, he tells the audience, the reader, how you can have eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, chapter five is actually, they say, is deemed to be one of the most important chapters in the Bible because it talks about the deity, the deity meaning that he is the son of Christ, that everything points to him. Now, out of 878 verses, 419 are penned of Jesus' words. And this morning, we're looking in chapter 5, between chapters 4 and 6, there's a two-year span. And there's only one miracle that took place in that two years, and that's the miracle that we're going to be looking at here this morning. In John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. The main idea for this morning is this. The excuses we give can spiritually paralyze our relationship with God. Let's look into verse 1. It says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, after this 
means is 50 weeks have gone by to the previous verse in verse 54 in chapter 4. John does not write in chronological order. He actually writes in a theological thesis is what it's called. It means that everything is, is geared towards the manifestation of glory of who Jesus Christ is. Because Jesus Christ, he's totally committed to the law. So he's going to go up to this feast that any male in the 20 mile radius would have gone to Jerusalem. Because three times a year they have uh, the, ta the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Passover, and the Feast of Pentecost. So Jesus would have gone up to this. It says in verse 2, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now there's three different things in this verse that are compacted. Today, the ruins are still there of the Pool of Bethesda. It's in the northern eastern corner of Jerusalem. And the Sheep Gate, this was a little tiny opening when you come into the city right outside of the temple. And it was very important because people would take the sheep and they would put it in the pool to cleanse them, to purify them before they went into the temple, before they made a sacrifice in the altar on the behalf of their sin. Maybe perhaps that's why John wrote in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God. You can only imagine all the residue that's left behind in these pools. And when you look at it, it says there's five porches. So when they built this, why not six? Why not eight? Why not 105? Well, if you looked at the pool of Bethesda, there was two porches on your right, Two porches on your left, and then there was a there's a walkway right in the middle of it. But why five? Anytime you see the number of five in the Word of God, it represents, it symbolizes God's grace. If you're taking notes, you might want to write that down because it goes perfect with what we're going to be speaking with this morning. Well, then you look at the word Bethesda. Bethesda means it is the house of outpouring. It is the house of mercy. And so we look at this in verse 3, it says, In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time to the pool and stirred up the water. That whoever stepped in first after stirring up the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. 38 years. Now, I know that when we look at verses 3 and 4, that it can kind of be a mystery, it can kind of be bizarre, it can kind of be strange to us due to the origins of the original text. But this morning, I want us to put our focus on this, is that these people expected, key word, they expected to God to, to, to heal them if, if they stepped into this water. However, if you notice in verse 5, that by God's grace, Jesus was on a rescue mission. He went for one particular man to teach the man and the rest of the people around these pools. <coughs> that it's about a relationship with Christ. It's about the grace of God and not the first person to step in the pool. It's not about favoritism. How do we know this? You look at verse 5. It says a certain man. Jesus knew he was going after a certain man. Why this individual? Because this individual had no hope. Everybody else evidently had hope in, in the springs that were coming in from Jerusalem that were pouring into this pool. This man had no hope. 38 years, this majority of his entire life, and he's just there. Well, Pastor, why did he just slide himself in? Because the pool of Bethesda actually is 30 feet down, and the stairwell is only 2 feet. So if the man would have scooted himself, he would have died. He would have fell 30 feet. So Jesus comes to him. He comes to him because this man has no hope. See, like the man who was focused on the healing of the water. I think many of us, a lot of times, we focus on the, on the situation at hand. And we can't see the bigger picture that God has for us. We're just stuck at the situation at hand and we feel hopeless. Maybe here, maybe you're here this morning, and you're going through a relationship crisis. Maybe it has to do something with your spouse, maybe with your grandchild, maybe with your child, maybe with your best friend. But it's a relationship crisis, and you feel hopeless. 
Or maybe, maybe this year just seemed very tragic to you because you lost something or you lost someone. And because without that someone, you feel like life is not the same and you feel hopeless. Or maybe because of the situations of the circumstances that's taken place in our society, maybe your finances are just stricken and they're very tight and you feel hopeless. Well, folks, this morning I want to give you encouragement. There is hope. Jesus comes to rescue. Jesus comes to rescue and to bring hope to the hopeless. We see it in verse 5 here. He comes to this man. Now, a certain man was there for 38 years. He comes to bring hope to the hopeless. In verse 6, when Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Jesus already supernaturally knew this guy's condition. He knew he had no hope. Jesus goes to him. Now, when we read this, on the surface, that's kind of a strange, crazy, bizarre question. I get to ask someone who's been paralyzed for 38 years, who's been an outcast, cannot go inside the temple, is just laying there. You know that going well, they want to get into this water for whatever reason. And then somebody comes along and says, do you want to be made well? Do you know what that's like? It's like when you're little, and you know you did something wrong, and your parents say, do you want a spanking? Well, the obvious answer is no. So we look at this and say, well, what's the obvious answer? What about us? What about us? As Jesus looks at us, we're paralyzed by our past hurts, we're paralyzed by sin, we're paralyzed by our circumstances, we're just paralyzed by our problems. And Jesus asked us the same question, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed from the hurt and the anguish and the pain that you've been holding on in your life? Or is it easier for us to be bitter, for us to make excuses, for us to hold on to something, for us to be cold and put up a wall? Or is it like this? This morning, to the one who was paralyzed by past hurts, Whatever that entails, whatever that holds, Jesus asks, do you want to be healed? To the one who is shackled by a secret sin, Jesus asks, do you want to be loosened of the chains from that sin? To the one who is struggling with some type of an addiction, Jesus asked, do you want to overcome that? To the one here this morning who is rebellious against God, you're wallowing in your filth and your shame and your sin, and you're saying it's all about me. Jesus reaches out and says, do you want to be rescued? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be redeemed? To the rest of us, Jesus asks, do you want to be healed from every aspect of your life? life. Do you want to be made well? Look in verse 6 at the word well. It's mentioned five times from verses 6 through 15. What that word means is it means to be free, it means to be cured, it means to be made whole. In essence, Jesus is asking the man, do you desire earnestly to be made whole? Physically and spiritually, do you desire to be made whole is what he's asking. The application for this this morning is to receive the healing Jesus has for us. We must desire to be changed. We must answer says, yes, Lord, I am ready to put the past behind me. Well, what about, what about us? Verse 7, what's the man's response? Jesus just asked him, do you want to be made well? Verse 7, 
He says, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus just asked this man, do you want to be made well? And this man gives an excuse. He says, I have no man. There's no one around me. The excuse that we also a lot of times make too is, is dependence upon people rather than God. Then he says this. He says, while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Someone's always in my way. Our excuse a lot of times we do is we blame others for our past failures. What about us today? When Jesus asked the question, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? What is our response? When Jesus asked, do you want to be healed from your past hurts? What's our response? Did we say, oh Lord, Pastor, you, you have no idea what I've been through. When Jesus asked, do you want to be loosened from the shackles of your secret sin? What is our response? Oh, I just, I can't overcome it. When Jesus asked the addict and says, do you want to overcome your addiction? What's our response? Addiction? It's not addiction. It's, 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 it's disease. I was born with this. It's my blood. It's in my family. It's just how it's always been. When Jesus asked the one here this morning, do you want to be saved? Do you want to be redeemed? Do you want me to draw you into the arms of the unconditional, graceful, merciful God and not be condemned to judgment and hell? Is our excuse, I'm really not that bad of a person. I'm actually better than this person. I'm better than this person. You should really see my family. I'm really better than a lot of people in my family. I mean, Jesus asked the man, do you want to be made well? And his response is, I have no one to put me in. This morning, today, instead of making excuses, put your faith into action. Put your faith into action. He continues on, he says, after he, the, the, this guy gives him all these excuses in verses 8 to 10, it says, Jesus said to him, rise. Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. Look, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured? It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. There are three action statements that Jesus literally gives this man. Do you know something? This man didn't say anything. This man couldn't offer anything. This man couldn't do anything. He gave an excuse. And Jesus, by the grace of God, still provides a miracle. The guy gets up and is a completely obedient. He's obedient. But no, he has an encounter with the Jews, the teachers of the law. And what it means that it was on Sabbath is because they were so legalistic, they wanted to stone him. But there's actually a law called Mishnah. In Hebrew, it means that you have to give someone a warning. Before you stone them on a Sabbath, you have to give them a warning. It's called mission. This guy had no warning. So however you want to see this miracle, it's an illustration of God's grace. No excuses. This morning there's a couple. There's a couple that goes to our church here. And like many of us, we've, we've endured pain and suffering like them. You know, the whole expression when it rains and pours. This couple in 2009, in January, he, um, he, was, re he was forced to retire. 40% of their income was lost. That same year in July, his wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. That same month, his mom died. Later on, they, they found out that, that their son is just completely rebellious against God and against them. And then a couple years later, they lose you know, her brother, they lose his brother, they lose his dad. It just keeps trickling out of effect. You find out that one of your kids has cancer. It just, it just keeps on and keeps on. 
But what I love about this company is that they were so transparent. Yes, they wrestled with things, but they didn't make excuses. They didn't wallow in their pity because they understood the grace of God and His promises and His faithfulness that He is a good God and is for the glory of God. But what I like most about this is that there's a chorus, there's a hymn. Many of you guys may know it's called Trust His Heart. And the chorus goes like this. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see his plan, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. So the application I want to give to you all this morning on this is you are asked to do what you can't do. To show that God is doing it. It's actually from Dr. Elmer Towns, who's the co-founder of Liberty University. There's things in our life that happen that we don't understand sometimes. But God is using that. God is pointing that. And so we don't have any excuses.